All right. So welcome everybody. My name is Jada Shapiro. I am the founder of Boober and Birthday Presents. Boober is a platform where expectant parents and new families can find all of their pregnancy to postpartum care providers like doulas, birth doulas, postpartum doulas, lactation consultants, and now mental health therapists, as we've been talking about with all of what's going on with COVID-19 and how quickly this came upon us. There's been so much anxiety and stress for everybody. This was something we planned to do in the future, but really knew it was very important right now. So you can also find mental health therapists here through Boober. We are hoping to be a resource to all of you. That's why we're doing these webinars and we've been getting really nice feedback that it's been helpful for expectant and new parents to have great experts to be able to listen to and learn from. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much for, for coming today. Um, I also am the founder of Birthday Presence, where we've been teaching childbirth classes and doula training for the last 18 years in New York City. So I'm really happy to have you all here, and I'm really excited to have our experts here today. Um, we have Julie Rosen, IBCLC, who is a board-certified lactation consultant, um, and we have Dr. Liza Natali, who is a pediatrician here with Pediatric Associates in New York City. Um, and I'm going to actually allow them to introduce themselves to you. They're both really wonderful um, fountains of knowledge. So, so excited to have you. So Julie, why don't you say hello? Hi, everybody. I am Julie Rosen. I've been in IBCLC since 2007. Um, and I am on the Boober platform as an IBCLC. Um, normally, when I'm not self-quarantining, I do home visits to support parents with their breastfeeding challenges. Um, and I do that in the New York City area and in Northern New Jersey as well. Um, I am married and I am the mother of two college age daughters who are self quarantining with us and baking cookies pretty much every day. <laughs> Thank you. And Dr. Natale. My name is Liza Natale. Um, as Jada mentioned, I am a pediatrician in private practice in Midtown Manhattan. Um, and when I am not, uh, I, I will talk a little bit more about our office, but in general, uh, when I'm not uh, self-quarantining and doing telemedicine, um, I am in, uh, in practice there seeing uh, birth through 21-year-olds um, and affiliated with NYU Medical Center. Great. Well, thank you so much. And what I didn't say yet is that all of our services, which were in person until a few weeks ago, are all virtual now. And that's part of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about newborns. We're going to talk about lactation, um, postpartum, and, and what does virtual care look like? Because both of these um, amazing people here today are providing lots of virtual care. And I think a lot of people have questions, um, not only about how to manage COVID-19 and how to deal with their with their baby breastfeeding and postpartum, um, but also how how these kind of visits work and, and how what kind of support can we get out there. So I just wanted to start, start with you, Dr. Natale. Um, the question that everybody has, and we know that there's some information out there, but I want to ask you directly today is, um, is the disease transmitted through breast milk? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So uh, the, there is a lot that we don't know about COVID-19 um, breast, but there is some stuff that we are, uh, we are learning and learning sort of rapidly as we need to. Um, so there is no evidence of COVID-19 in breast milk. There is no evidence of COVID-19 in amniotic fluid. So in terms of transmission of infection, it is uh, postpartum through res uh, respiratory droplets, um, but not through uh, breast milk. Okay, and so a lot of people have this question. First of all, is it safe to continue to breastfeed or start to breastfeed while, especially when they're in a hot spot like New York City, somewhere where they feel, you know, there's just so much around them, but they are not symptomatic. Um, they are at home. Can they breastfeed? Should they be breastfeeding? So um, the recommendation is if your plan was to breastfeed, then you should breastfeed. Um, there are certain scenarios that um, if you are feeling awful and feeling very sick and you need to rest, then those would be instances that you would make that decision not to breastfeed. But with regard to the safety of your baby, it is absolutely fine to breastfeed. The recommendation, like with everything that we've been hearing, is it is essential to wash your hands. So you know, anybody who has a newborn is washing their hands before they pick them up. But sometimes we get a little bit cavalier 
Um, and so it's really, really important before you're holding your baby, feeding your baby, that you are washing your hands. Um, if you do have any kind of cough, congestion, even sort of clearing your throat, you can emit some respiratory droplets to your baby who's in your arms um, that you cover your mouth and nose. So that can be some type of um, mask. Now, this could be, if, and it doesn't have to be an N95, it shouldn't be an N95 because you'll asphyxiate yourself. Um, it can be a surgical mask if you have them, but if you don't, it could also be sort of a piece of cloth or something that you're, you know, a makeshift. Um, it's mask. okay The people who are making masks for themselves, if they don't have a mask, you would recommend yes, that. That is absolutely fine. And then you're just washing it. Um, but the idea is that um, you're not going to cough inadvertently or sneeze while you're nursing and it lands on your baby's face and gets into their nose, mouth, or eyes. Um, for um, pumping, same goes, is that you want to make sure that you're washing your hands well before you use the pump um, and, there were, and that you are cleaning the pump um, you know, cleaning the pump well, which is usually if most of you have a dishwasher, the top rack of the dishwasher. Um, in our country, generally, you don't have to sterilize anything. Hot, soapy water is sufficient. Um, COVID-19 is not like a very crafty virus. It's, it, it, it is killed by the things that we typically clean up after, you know, clean up with the soap and water. This is why washing your hands for 20 seconds um, you're going to eliminate the, the virus on your hand for the, that moment. You don't need to use antibacterial soaps. You don't need to go sort of crazy about it. And so the same thing applies to the, to the equipment that you're using. Um, so the most important thing, again, is just clean hands. Okay. And, and if somebody actually is COVID positive, we have a lot of questions out there about if, if we are COVID positive, do you have to do more sterilization than, than not? Or what you're saying right now is just that the general way we clean will kill the virus, just to clarify. Yeah, so, so I should say that, that I would assume if you live in New York City, you're COVID-19 positive, unless you can prove otherwise. I mean, it is mm -hmm. everywhere and there is a varying range of symptoms. So you can be completely asymptomatic you could have mild symptoms. We're getting into allergy season that you're going to attribute to allergies. You could have a little bit of a, you know, snotty nose, or you could be, you know, quite sick with, with shortness of breath. So there's a very wide range. Not fever isn't even a, a good indicator. You can be a, uh, we call a febrile without fever. Um, so the presumption should be that even if you have no symptoms that you want to at this time, just be super cautious. And I'm not saying wear a mask if you're asymptomatic, but if you have like a drippy nose and you're thinking like it's at my allergy time of year, don't just assume that you want to be extra cautious. But that does not mean you have to over sterilize or wash your hands until they're bleeding. I mean, you, you know, it's the same thing. You wash your hands before you hold your baby. You wash your hands before you feed. You wash your hands before you pump. You wash your hands um, a lot. And you try to avoid touching your face. So that is another really important thing, which uh, is amazing how often we do unknowingly. Um, and so sometimes people will wear a mask just as not to necessarily protect them because it doesn't really show that it protects someone who's asymptomatic, but to prevent us from touching our face because we then all of a sudden realize like, oh, I touch my face a lot, you know, and then, and then we sort of retrain ourselves not to do that as much. Thank you. So a lot of people certainly have concerns about newborns. We've that we've understood that that children seem to be faring better and 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 babies as well. People just have that question for you though. Can you speak a little bit to how newborns are faring? And, and another question a lot of people had is what would the sign be that my baby might have COVID-19 and what shall I what should I do in that case? So um, what we are seeing from uh, the the epidemic in China. Um, you know, also in Italy and, and so far here in the US is that children really serve more as a vector than they do um, as, as um, victims of the, of the, significant victims of the disease. So um, we know that because if you, if you hear from any hospital, they have given up some of their ICU space and some of their pediatric ward space to the adults. 
Um, so it really isn't affecting children in the same way. Um, there are always exceptions, obviously, but we have, you know, very few uh, children, including infants and babies, that we have had, uh, that we have heard of with regard to any sort of issues or concerns. Any baby, any newborn in the first six weeks of their life, if they have a rectal temperature of 100.4, which is 38 degrees Celsius or higher, is an automatic admission to the hospital. I should say four to six weeks, not up to necessarily six weeks. Um, so that is an indication that your baby might be sick. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's COVID-19. There could be many things and babies don't localize infection the way that we do. So we take it very seriously when a newborn has a fever of 100.4 or higher. Um, and again, that's between four and six months, uh, four and six weeks of age. Um, and then beyond that, you're just going to look at your baby and you're going to see like, are they breathing comfortably? Are they feeding well? Are they eliminating as they normally would? Do they look hydrated? All of these things, I think that we sometimes overthink it and we sometimes overanalyze, like, how will I know? You're gonna know. You're gonna know when your baby is sick. The same mm -hmm. way that you know if you have a dog, you know when your dog is sick. Your dog mm -hmm. doesn't tell you anything, they don't tell you, but they're like, they just look off and you're like, ah, I should probably do something about that. It's the same with your baby. Um, and I think what's really important is that you trust your instinct with that and you try not to get overburdened and overwhelmed by all the information out there and then start to second guess your own instinct of, of when your baby is, is in need of, of medical attention. Thank you. And so if, if I feel my baby is off, if something does not look right um, and I am reaching out to my pediatrician, what is the current protocol? Because I know we're trying to limit the amount of times we're going out. Are we to come to your office? Do you want people to call first ahead of time? How, how do you deal with that? So right now, um, I mean, I'll speak for, for my practice, but I'm pretty confident that we all feel this, all sort of general pediatricians are feeling the same way right now, that we want you to call us first. There is a lot that we can uh, counsel over the phone. We want people to stay home and away from uh, medical facilities as much as possible to protect themselves, but also to protect others if you're, if you're ill. Um, so calling, a lot of uh, practices have, have started telemedicine. I think most practices have started telemedicine. There's a lot we can do remotely. Um, and then if there is a feeling that a baby needs to be seen uh, in the office, then your individual pediatrician will make that decision and make sure that you come in at an appropriate time where you're not putting yourself or anybody else uh, at risk. Um, most, you know, we, we know that newborns need to be seen. And so newborn babies should be going to their pediatrician, at least for the first checkup after they leave the hospital, because babies now after delivery are leaving the hospital sooner. We're trying to get families home and out of the, the hospital as quickly as we can in a safe way. So, you know, after a vaginal delivery, um, 24 hours. After a C-section, it might be 48 hours. Obviously, if there are issues with baby or mom, that's, you know, that's not a hard and fast rule, but we know that the best place for people to be is, is home. And so we're trying to do that. And so when you leave the hospital so early, it's really essential to, to be seen and evaluated by a pediatrician um, early on. And then you can do virtual follow-ups as needed. And so I've heard that some people, so you're saying um, 24 hours is considered kind of the earliest release um, but I have heard people asking the question, what if I am feeling well and ready to leave at 12 hours or six hours even as some birth centers you know, would do that release? Um, can you explain a little bit about why, why people maybe shouldn't or what your opinion is about that early release? So there are certain screenings that are done for all newborns at the 24 hour mark. One of them is the newborn state screening, which screens for many, depending on what state you're in, it, it varies. Um, if you're in New York state, it's, it's a very good one. It screens for you know, over 50 rare metabolic conditions that if addressed early uh, can have um, a lasting effect on the baby's growth and development. So if you miss it, 
um, then it could be in some instances catastrophic. And so the reason that has to be done after 24 hours of life, it is not valid prior to that because now the state may change those rules, but I always am a little bit curious if you're changing the rules now, then why couldn't we have changed the rules, you know, six months ago if people could go home earlier. But I just, I think that the potential for, oh, I'm being sloppy, I'm sorry. Um, the potential for uh, uh, missing that. So if you go home early and then, you know, there's a there's something that's frightening to you and you don't want to leave the house and then you don't see a pediatrician for a while, um, then that's very concerning because that could be missed. Okay. Um, and a couple people are, are writing in and I have heard that if a pediatrician's office is able to offer the PKU, would you, would then that be different if they're able to do any of the screening? Somebody asked that who's out there who said that, that their office can. So most pediatrician's office can do it because we sometimes have to repeat it in our office. Um, I think it's important to know if they're on skeleton staff, if they can actually do it. Um, and I also, I, I, I would feel uh, very concerned that once you leave the hospital, not the person who asked the question, but you know, that someone may not show, show up. up. And I, I wouldn't want to take that, I, you know, that's very concerning to me. And I, and I personally would not feel comfortable um, having a list of people that I need to make sure did, did the test and what, what if it was missed. And, you know, it's not something that is, we don't do, the things we do and check in newborns are not, you know, done lightly. Mm -hmm. You know, we do these things because we think that they are incredibly valuable. And I get concerned about discharging people too early. The other thing is that, you know, uh, like Jada's group is doing remote breastfeeding support. When you're in the hospital, you can have an actual lactation consultant working with you if you are breastfeeding, if you need a little bit of support. Um, if it's a second kid or you're, you know, comfortable and confident, but leaving, you know, it's, it's not always easier in, in the you know, first 24 hours at home. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think sometimes, you know, you need help walking to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. You still haven't necessarily, you know, had a, you know, they wouldn't let you leave before you pee, but still, you know, it's just, it, it's, it, it's a lot. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. It's just a question that keeps coming up. Um, I have some other questions about hospital protocols for you. If a birthing parent tests positive, um, what is the protocol of whether or not we need to separate the birthing parent from the baby? There's a lot of concern around this right now. And I, I know that there are some different opinions um, and that it could be a case by case discussion or, or, or is your hospital have a blanket statement on this? People, a lot of people have this question. And yeah, and actually, and if it is the protocol to separate, is there the right to refuse such separation with um, an AMA or, a, you know, some type of consent form? So um, because there is that risk of, uh, the only risk is going to be post-delivery um the feeling within the hospital is that uh it is too great of a risk to have mom and baby if if mom test positive or being that she's the birth parent being in the room with the baby mm -hmm. um so uh i can only speak for nyu we are separating mom and baby um, for those moms who are breastfeeding um, or plan to breastfeed, we're uh, encouraging them to pump so that they can start and to maintain a, a, a milk supply. Um, it is not something that we do lightly. It is not that we know that the best place for babies is with their, with their parents. Um, but we do it because we want to make sure that the baby is uh, safe while we and and monitored more closely while we are um assessing them postpartum because the if mom is positive uh she was tested the newborn is also tested so even though we're confident that you're not getting it other than respiratory droplets we are testing those babies 
And then the other thing is that parents have their partners there as well. And so that's another added exposure. And some hospitals are not allowing uh, postpartum partners, partners to be in the postpartum ward. But I believe that part of Cuomo's executive order this past weekend was that um, mom was entitled to have a partner during labor and delivery, as well as the immediate postpartum period. Um, and in that, what hospitals are doing is that if that partner leaves the hospital, they are no longer allowed to return. And all of this is about limiting potential exposure. So most of us are worried about making sure that we don't give our babies COVID-19. So the idea of separating a mom who's COVID-19 positive allow, and separating her from the baby is, is in, in the, an effort to decrease the risk of the baby transmitting the infection, uh, you know, mom transmitting the infection to the baby. Um, we are also, you know, most hospitals uh, encourage rooming in so that the baby is with the mom at all times. Um, and in, in NYU, at least, we, for the non-COVID positive moms, uh, the babies are uh, very briefly taken to the nursery for their examination by the pediatrician and then brought back to mom. And that's another thing that I know is very distressing for people because they don't like their babies being taken away. Um, but the nursery is really the safest place for the pediatrician to examine the baby. Um, the only people in the nursery are healthcare providers. It's not random people wandering in and out. Um, and uh, it decreases the number of exposures that that healthcare provider is going to have when they come to examine your baby. So if they're constantly going in and out of rooms with partners and parents and, you know, you know it's New York, well, this is in New York, it's tight quarters, um, it increases the exposure. So the feeling is the safest place for the baby is to examine separate from uh, the, the mom in the nursery and then the baby is brought back and, and the pediatrician will then decide either to phone the parent or to go into the room and keep the social distancing of six feet while they, while they speak about the baby. So if the, if the birthing parent is positive <laughs> and the, the baby is being separated, does that look like a six foot away? Are they still in the same room? Can they see No, they're in a separate kind of, um, I say like a like an observation room. They're in a room um, with other um, six more than six feet away from other babies mm -hmm. who are also born to COVID positive mothers. Now, this doesn't apply to COVID positive partners. Okay, so that was the next question. A lot of people have. Yeah. So if a partner is positive, that partner will not be at the hospital and will not be allowed to stay in the hospital. Um, and those partners are having their temperature checked every 12 hours and are being monitored for symptoms. So even though they are not a patient in the hospital, they too are being monitored for any symptoms. And if they develop any types of symptoms or a fever, they are asked to leave. Okay. That being said, you can be asymptomatic, as I mentioned before, and, and have COVID-19, or you can be asymptomatic several days before manifesting symptoms. So that's why I said very much in the beginning that like we need to assume that with that, with, in the absence of, of available testing that we are sort of all positive and could potentially infect someone else. So in that time of distancing, an, another question that a lot of people have then, if we're separating the parent, are they still, if the, if the birthing parent is positive, are they going to send the baby home with the birthing parent? Yes. Yes. Okay. So they absolutely, and there's going to be counseling about, you know, appropriate care of the baby at home, including, um, you know, hand washing, wearing a mask when you're holding the baby. Um, so masks are very important when people are symptomatic. That, that does prevent the spread of illness. Right. And I know, I know at every hospital it's different. So for the people out there listening, you know, you do want to check in at, at your particular 
location what the plan is and we know that the plan is, is basically changing very frequently very very rapidly right? yeah i think that's really important you could go on a on a hospital's website and read their current plan and you can show up there the next day and it could be totally different and this is not you know this comes out of you know we everything is changing so quickly um, and people are really doing their best to maintain some sense of normalcy during this, um, but it's a very abnormal time. And so things can change. And I, and I just suggest that like going into it, knowing that everything that is happening is in the best interest of you and your baby, it is not to make things you know, more challenging or more difficult. So it's possible if more research or something suggests um, that the babies could go, I, I heard it one hospital babies are, are going on the chest with um, a sterile uh, sheet. I've heard, I've heard different things, right? Yeah, and, and I think that, I think, um, you know, certain facilities are going to be more conservative than other facilities. So I know that Mount Sinai and Columbia in New York are, have very, very strict, you know, uh, guidelines. NYU is kind of in the middle. There may be others that are more relaxed at this point. And when I say relaxed, meaning they, they feel that they can sort of control the spread by doing various things. Now, one of the other things we have to keep in mind is that, you know, we don't have enough positive, I mean, we don't have enough protective gear. Right. So we can't um, you know, in a perfect world, if there was somebody who was positive, we would give them a you know fresh mask every day and sort of like what we've done in the past and and we don't have access to that. So it just makes it that much harder when, you know, we're trying to accommodate fa new families and, and, you know, keeping people trying to keep people healthy. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. It's a question that we're probably have to, we're going to move on for right now. People have so many questions about this, but I think that's a really, really big issue is, you know, that parents are, are concerned about. So, um, so thank you for answering what's happening. I, I mean, I, I guess, I guess as we move on and we can get to it, but like, I'm, I'm curious what people are concerned about, or are they just sad and disappointed? Yeah. Because I think the, the curiosity about it is, is what we've talked about, but I wonder, is it that it's just not how you envisioned it? This isn't what you wanted? Are you worried that something's going to happen to your baby when you're not with them? Like, I'm just sort of curious to go, not necessarily this moment, but like yeah. for people to think a little bit deeper about what it is that is so, why that is such a popular question and why um, it's hard to accept the sort of straightforward answer. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's very, you know, triggering for parents who definitely, we, we all know about initial skin to skin and contact and people instinctively, of course, need and want to be with their babies. So I think that it's just. You know, it's, and that's a good point. I don't know that, um, and I would have to find this out, but I don't, I don't know that the initial skin to skin is eliminated. I don't, I, I swear, as you say that, I'm wondering if people think that it's going to be like some, you know, horror movie where like the baby is born and whisked off somewhere away from the parents and they never see the baby for, you know, I don't, I, I do think that there is, because there's a lot of uh, evidence to support that initial skin to skin and that yeah. initial, so in the, in the delivery room, they may have, you know, those, those mothers are going to be wearing a mask. And so they may feel that that is okay. They assess the baby, they this, they that, baby's six feet away for a period of time. So I think that that's something to ask actually the OB yeah. about how that's happening. Yeah, I think that would be, that's something I've heard from different places. And that's why I think everybody should ask in their individual circumstance, because a lot of um, you know, people are recommending, even if you're sick, you can breastfeed your baby the real way right we're transferring is through the droplets as you said and so if we are able to protect ourselves sufficiently with a mask and proper gear then you know are we able to stay and and be with our babies and we're seeing different guidelines from who and and arcog as somebody posted we're seeing a, a couple different things about this particular issue as to whether it's really critical so that's i think why it's the big conversation so thank you for an answering we have lots lots more questions so i'm going to shift um a little bit for a moment to julie so we can talk a little bit about some of the lactation questions that are coming up and then i want to shift back to you dr natalie to um, finish with talking about all of the visiting questions people have a lot of visitor questions so we'll go back to that in a second so 
Hi, Julie. Um, for people who are not familiar with what an IBCLC is, or an International Board Certified Lactation Consultant, can you tell us a little bit about your training and what it is you, you do? What it is I do. So um, <laughs> these days it's a little different. Um, my training. So my background actually is as a La Leche League leader, which is one of the pathways to becoming an IBCLC. La Leche League is a volunteer breastfeeding organization. Uh, I was a group leader for five years um, and got 2,500 documented hours of helping uh, breastfeeding parents um, with their challenges, um, whether it was in uh, group sessions or home visits, uh, phone calls, things like that. Um, I took some uh, college level coursework on things like anatomy and physiology, psychology, um, pharmacology, and that qualified me to sit for the IBC LC exam, which I have to retake uh, now every 10 years um, and every five years uh, recertify by um, continuing ed credits. Actually, they just changed it so we can recertify uh, by continuing ed only. Um, so in terms of what we are the experts on, we are the experts on infant feeding, um, whether we know a lot about bottle feeding, which always surprises people. Um, I do, um, I give evidence-based care to families regarding any feeding issues, lactation from preconception all the way through weaning. I assess uh, the breastfeeding parent um, anatomically. I ask a lot of health history questions to determine if there's anything in that health history that may impact uh, their lactation experience. Um, I wanna know about the birth. I want to know about, you know, how, how things have been going with breastfeeding, um, any previous lactation experiences that the parent may have had. Um, I want to get the full background. My in-person consultations have taken about two hours. Uh, sometimes the virtual consultations will take that long also, although I'm finding them, them to be more efficient um, because I can really schedule them exactly when baby is ready to feed and I have a lot of flexibility with starting time because I'm home. Um, I don't have to worry about travel, getting in the car, you know, figuring out the, you know, the George Washington Bridge and, you know, and like that. So um, in a consultation, whether it's at home or virtually, I do a feeding assessment. Uh, again, when baby's ready to feed, uh, having taken all that information. Um, uh, I do like to get my hands uh, on babies to, to look at them, to feel their suck with a gloved finger, which unfortunately I cannot do in a virtual session. Um, but I have had really good success with having parents um, able to show me uh, parts of their, you know, uh, show me what's going on in the baby's mouth, to lift the tongue so I can examine a frenulum and see if that might be a culprit. Um, things like that. I will watch a mom, uh, or, or a breastfeeding parent, I'm sorry, breastfeed uh, her baby. I'll watch a full feeding. I'll make observations about um, how the sucking looks to me. Is that active sucking? Is that non-nutritive sucking? Is the baby being efficient? Is the baby being too sleepy? Um, what does sucking sound like? I mean, what does swallowing sound like? What does swallowing look like? What does a contented baby look like? And I do all of the things that I would do in an in-person consultation. Um, I'm just more hands-off and I require a good camera person now. So um, I really want the breastfeeding parent to have somebody there, ideally, you know, their partner, um, who's really good with working a phone camera to show me a bird's eye view of latch, to show me what that sore nibble looks like so I can do the best assessment possible um, for a virtual uh, consultation. Um, and, then I, and then I make recommendations, you know, based on everything that I've seen and everything we talked about that are, um, you know, in line with what the parents' need, own needs are and what their goals are. Yeah, well, it seems, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize that they can, that a virtual assessment actually can be effective and be helpful. And I think one of the things we've been talking about with virtual support, virtual postpartum support and lactation support is that uh, almost the same as in person, that it's not just about the lactation assessment, right? Um, you're spending time with the with the lactating parent, with the parents. Um, and, and you told me something earlier when we were talking, which I thought was really interesting. Um, about the difference right now in the people that you're seeing that because they don't have anybody helping mm -hmm. at home, a lot of them don't have parents, they don't have the postpartum doula overnight um, or the baby nurse, you know, so what kind of things are you able to connect with parents about and help help them in other ways in addition to the latch and all of what you just talked about? Um, well, and, and Dr. Natalie actually approached this also, parents are getting discharged early and parents who are counting on a helpful postpartum nurse to show them how to bathe, give a sponge bath to a baby, or um, 
to you know burping techniques or diaper changing techniques or things that we can pick up the slack on. Um, I've always done that in my consultations. You know, if I see that parents have a baby carrier um, I, or a pump, I wanna show them how to use it. Um, but I'm offering that you know, all the more so now because I think parents are feeling like they were counting on additional support, people to show them the ropes with their brand new babies. Um, and they're feeling like they're, um, you know, because of the circumstances, they're not getting that. Um, so I've done a lot of that. I've done a lot of this is, aside from feeding, this is all normal, normal newborn behavior. This is normal sleeping um, cycles for babies. This is, uh, you know, yeah, it's true. A lot of babies really don't want to be put down um, in those first few days uh, when, you know, after you get home and how to put a baby down so he or she is more likely to stay asleep and not wake right back up. You know, things like that. I want to be there to address parents' concerns. So how are you helping parents to assess whether or not the baby is getting enough milk? And this is maybe a question for, for both of you. Um, actually, so first off, Julie, you know, how do you typically, parents, a lot of people wrote in, how do I know if the baby's getting enough, right? So how do you, from the lactation consultant perspective, know or help the parent figure out if the baby is getting enough? And also kind of what are the flags where you would send them back to call their pediatrician? And then after I'll ask you, Dr. Natale, when do you know, based on an assessment, that they really need to see a virtual lactation consultant? You know, So let's start with you, Julie. Well, I think it's good to remember that we haven't always had scales available to us throughout history. And we've had to um, just look at our babies and, and assess our babies and, and follow our instincts. As Dr. Natale mentioned, we're all given really good instincts about these things. Um, well, I always say what goes in must come out. So I want to know about diapers. And Jada, you asked me earlier, you know, do you like to see, do you want to have parents show you their diapers? And I'm like, yeah, I definitely want to see diapers. People, parents are always texting me pictures of diapers and warning me, like I haven't seen a billion diapers and I'm like, you know, I'm totally not grossed out by them, by the way. So please send me your diapers. Um, because I can look at the color and I can look at the volume, the bulk. I can, you know, if somebody sends me what they think is a pee diaper and it looks very concentrated, that's going to be concerning to me, you know, on day three or day, or, you know, day four. Um, so I want to hear the diaper count. And thankfully, because parents have access to all of these great apps, they're really keeping great track of, of these things. Um, and I think, you know, keeping track of it at home is, is a really helpful thing to do, especially when we don't have the scale. Um, a good thing to do is, is use your app or put out, you know, 10 diapers a day at the beginning of the day, starting at midnight and see how many you've gone through by the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, that's another way of telling. How does the baby look at the end of breastfeeding? Did the baby come off on their own from the breast and have this sort of milk coma-like look when they detached from the breast? Um, or did the baby, was the baby still attached but just fell asleep and, and the parent had to detach the baby and then the baby started rooting right away after feeding? You know, when a baby is contented, you hear good swallowing at the beginning, it slows down sort of throughout the feed, but eventually baby in a reasonable period of time, baby comes off the breast on its own with that milk coma look that we like to see. Um, and uh, feeding efficiency, right? We don't want every single feeding to take an hour, an hour and a half where the baby's at the breast and mostly sleeping. A baby who's on the breast for too long is actually not getting enough milk. Feeding efficiency, if you ask speech and language pathologists, is about 40 to 45 minutes for a newborn for most feedings, allowing for some cluster feeding, you know, a few longer feedings if the baby slept a little of a longer stretch um, and like that. Is the baby having active alert periods where they're not constantly looking for food? Are they just engaging with, with parents in a happy way without constantly looking for food? Um, and and um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else. Um, babies should feel, start to feel a little heavier to parents, you know, over, over time. They should be outgrowing their little stretchies. You know, you, you should see them filling, you know, filling out. Babies are supposed to be chunky. They're supposed mm -hmm. to have cheeks and rolls and you want to see them filling out. Thank you. Yeah, and, and also one of the things we've been hearing, and I'll ask you, Dr. Natalia, as we jump to you for a sec, um, if they don't have a scale, you know, can they use, um, have you seen them using food scales, pastry scales? We've been, we've been hearing about that um, as well. So Dr. Natale, are you okay with, with um, kind of homemade, not homemade, <laughs> but 
<laughs> skills, they, skills they already have. Well, I mean, I actually, I, I mean, I totally agree with what Julie was just saying is that you're going to get a sense if your baby is, is satisfied. Um, we also look at output and we want to make sure that they're voiding and stooling and the consistency of their stool and the volume of their stool and all of the same things. Um, the objective number is, is helpful to us. It makes us feel better or, you know, sometimes we counsel based on that, but uh, all of the things that Julie said make sense. Now, I do find that people um, are much more data driven these days and like to have the numbers because you know, they want to make sure that they're not missing something or, you know, um, and, uh, and I mean, you can take pictures of your naked baby and then you can sort of see it rather than day by day when you're staring at them all the time, you look each week and you'll see like, oh, he's a little fuller. But um, yeah, you can use any kind of scale that your baby is not going to fall off of. So if you have a food scale, someone, I just had a telemedicine visit with someone and they used a food scale and it worked perfectly. Um, you can use, uh, like if you have a digital scale at home, you can weigh yourself and then hold the baby, fully naked baby, and then, or totally naked, and then uh, subtract, and you can get, you know, a rough idea. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that is just, it, it is going to be a rough idea, but that, I, I feel like sometimes that just makes us feel better. It's not, it's not necessary. I wouldn't go out and buy a scale just because of this sort of bizarre time. And, um, you know, most of, uh, you know, again, when I speak about pediatricians, I'm speaking about our practice, but I assume a lot of us are doing the same thing is that we're doing the initial uh, newborn visit because that's really essential. And then normally we do, especially with breastfeeding babies, we do weekly visits or even more frequently until babies, uh, you know, are, are following a nice trend or get back to their birth weight. And if we have concerns in that first month when we're doing these sort of telemedicine visits, if there's concern about supply or output or whatever it is, then, you know, it still falls into the newborn visit and you come into, to, you know, you go into your pediatrician's office and, and you can, you know, reassess. Um, the the reason for trying to, you know, we, we don't, someone, I, I noticed on the chat, someone was asking about going to the pediatrician's office. and. I think it's important for babies to have a, you know, to have an exam um, after being in the hospital um, and then really only as needed in that beginning period um, based on be it, you know, a, a virtual lactation assessment that, they, that there's concern or a, a, a telemedicine visit with your pediatrician who, who expresses some, some concern about the weight. Thank you. And last question, Julie, anything that people should have at home if they're ordering things now or trying to get ready if, you know, if they haven't already had the baby? Um, yes. Everybody who um, is uh, subject to the Affordable Care Act or gets benefits from the Affordable Care Act is entitled to a free breast pump. Um, so, you know, there are, there's a brand that I really like that almost all insurance companies offer called the Spectra S1 or S2. Um, you might as well have it. You never know if you're going to need it to help relieve some engorgement at the beginning, just to pump off a little bit to feel better. If you're going to need to supplement your baby, um, your own milk is, is, you know, the best first supplement. Um, bottles, you don't know, uh, you know, how well latch is going to go. If your baby needs to be supplemented, having a couple of bottles in the house is really helpful. Um, I have another favorite brand that I like. I like the Dr. Brown's their original, their skinny bottle, um, ideally with a preemie nipple, so it's a nice slow flow, um, so that baby will go back and forth between breast and bottle more easily. Um, I think those things are really helpful to have, just you know, just in case. Um, and you know, that's I think that those are pretty much the, the main necessities if, if those are things that you're still in the market to get. Yeah, and if somebody doesn't have a, a breast pump at home and either due to COVID-19 needs to, to pump, um, you're able through virtual assessment to be able to teach them how to, how to hand, hand, um, hand milk, hand yes. express. Yes, and I have definitely done that. Um, that's a, you know, that's, there's uh, somebody wonderful um, in, in uh, Brooklyn named Francie Webb actually who has a book called Go Milk Yourself. I didn't think I was gonna plug for Francie, but she's amazing. She teaches courses online. Um, for anybody who's really into hand expressing, 
yes, it is definitely something I show parents how to do. Um, but you know, if we all have access to, uh, and I'll, you know, uh, we, if we all have access to pumps that can be a good adjunct to hands expressing as well. Thank you. And a couple more questions. Now I want to just kind of finish up with the, the newborn because there's so many questions. Dr. Natali, can people go out with their newborn right now? Can they go take a walk? How do they do it in the safest way possible? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us over a few minutes because I think there's still a lot, a, a lot of questions I want to get to on the newborn and we'll kind of just maybe go five more minutes. Um, so yes, um, you can go out. Getting fresh air is good for you, good for the baby. Um, my main thing, and I would say this regardless, of COVID-19 or other, you just want to be um, six feet away from all of those well-meaning strangers that get excited about a new baby and try to look at your baby and, you know, it's okay to be a little rude now. Um, but, you know, putting something over, you know, the, the, if it's cold out, the plastic is great. Um, if it's getting warmer out, then you can do, you know, mosquito netting or something that is going to sort of keep them. Now, the mosquito netting isn't going to protect you from respiratory droplets, which is why I like the plastic, but I don't want them to be too hot. Um, but yeah, going for a walk is fine. It's just you have to maintain that social distancing and you have to wash your hands. And if you happen to have Purell, have it with you. Um, that's very hard to find these days. So um, if you don't, you just basically don't touch anything until you get home and wash your hands. Um, but yeah, I think it's absolutely fine to go out and get fresh air. It's, it's important for everybody on the self-quarantine. If you're pregnant, if you're, you know, have friends, you know, like we have to get outside. That's important. Um, you just don't congregate together. You just, you know, go and you get a walk, you get a walk in or some fresh air. And how are you, thank you, how are you advising people in terms of, I mean, every other person has written in, what about grandparents? Can they come visit? What about, um, you know, what if they've been quarantined for 14 days or we've been quarantined? You know, how, how do we approach this with visitors right now? I think people really so, want. So um, when I say this, I'm not trying to be insensitive. Um, because I understand that grandparents are excited and we want their help and all of that and, they, and we want to introduce them to our babies. But right now is not really the time, especially in New York City. So it's one thing if you're someplace where we're not seeing as many cases yet, but the reality is that you're putting everyone at risk because you could be asymptomatic, your parent could be asymptomatic, the baby can get it, you could get it. You know, if you're, if, if you get it by having any extra people you have close contact with um, increases your risk of infection. And if you get sick, it's a lot harder to take care of a newborn. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's an older generation of people who are not as worried about this. And it may be because they've lived through the measles and polio and you know they can live through this too. But they're the, they're the population that we are most concerned about. Um, and you would much rather have them around to get to know your grandbaby, their grandbaby later on, than come and risk getting in your elevator if you live in an elevator building, pressing the button, seeing the doorman call, you know, like they're all these, they should stay home as well. Um, and, and on the reverse side, so you have a ton of questions that have been coming in too. Well, what if my parents live in another place and I were to go there, can I quarantine somewhere else for 14 days in some kind of home structure and then, then visit the parent, grandparents or? So a lot of provided that, I mean, yes, in essence, if you are in a bubble for 14 days and you don't have any contact with anyone and then you go into their bubble, you can merge them, yes. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really, a, I mean, these are decisions that people have to make based on their comfort um, and following the guidelines. I mean, the guidelines are middle generation people should not be with the older generation right now. We should not be risking that possible infection. And, um, you know, I'm honestly, you know, while I'm concerned about the baby because I don't want the baby to get sick, I'm, I'm equally concerned about a parent giving it to, to the grandparent. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, it, I mean, it's, it's this is incredibly, incredibly contagious. I mean, these measures that, that our government has set in are, are like, 
I mean, this is something like this has never happened. This is this is the fact that you know basically nobody is working out of the home except essential people. You know, it's it's craziness, and so we have to take it very seriously. And we've seen a lot of situations where people are not taking it seriously, and then it, it becomes a real problem. And so I think that it's it you know in that scenario, I know I I sound like a Scrooge, but I think it's really in the best interest of everybody to, to be, you know, your nuclear family, your new family. And then like, as things lighten up, then, you know, adding grandparents and close family and stuff. Thank you. And one more question linked to that. A lot of people wrote in about wondering about their toddler. So what if they have an older child at home, they've gone into the hospital, now they're coming home, what precautions should be taken? So um, with the toddler, you're going to so there are two points of this. Do you mean who watches the toddler? Or do you mean what do you do about the toddler and having a newborn and all? I guess the, the parents seem to be most concerned that, or, or both, but really concerned that I've gone in now to the hospital and I'm coming back home. I've been out and potentially exposed for a couple of days. Do I need to socially distance from my own older children? So um, you can't. <laughs> Um, you know, they, they are going to be all over you. They're going to be transitioning in their own way to having a new sibling. If you isolate from them, it's going to create that much more, um, you know, distress for them in the fact that not only has their life been uprooted because they're stuck at home, but now there's another little person that gets all of your attention. And, you know, so I think what's most important is that um, you practice the exact same hygiene practices. So anytime you're touching, you, if you touch a surface, then you wash your hands. If you touch your face, you wash your hands. If you change a diaper, you wash your hands. I mean, it's just, it, it's nonstop hand washing. Um, cleaning all the surfaces that your toddler is going to touch and that you're going to touch. So the refrigerator handles, the light switches, the doorknobs, you know, the commonly touched um, things in the, in the house. You know, everybody gets really obsessed about the floor. Nobody, the floor is the floor. Like that's like probably the cleanest place in the house. It's really where, you know, like if you're on your phone even, make sure you're cleaning your phone because we all know our phones are filthy. Um, and so it's just, it's that type of stuff. But you, you can't, you know, if you are having symptoms with regard to your toddler, then you need to distance yourself a little bit more or you need to wear a mask. Um, and, you know, continue to wash your hands. I mean, we can't, we, we can only do what we can do, you know, so if that, it, you know, you have to, you have to take care of your own babies, but you don't have to take care of your parents. Thank you. Now, maybe in a couple of years. <laughs> yes, thank you. And one more question for Julie. Um, how do I know the difference between reflux and normal spit up? Because that, that is a question that's come up for some people. Am I talking to my lactation consultant? Is this normal? Am I going back to the pediatrician? Um, well, they're, they're um, babies who we call happy spitters. Um, they spit up a lot until they really have better head control and are sitting more on their own for about six months. Um, they've always been happy spitters. Uh, spitting up by definition is reflux. It's a question of whether they have reflux disease. So a baby who is miserable, um, who is uh, having difficulty gaining weight or losing weight because they're spitting up too much milk, that's when we get concerned um, and we want to uh, refer back to the pediatrician for, for an assessment. Um, I always recommend, honestly, um, you know, I hate to tell parents to start eliminating foods because I know how much I hated to have to do it myself when I was breastfeeding. Um, and I love my ice cream, um, especially during quarantine. But um, a lot of cases of reflux I've seen improve at least, uh, of babies who are unhappy with reflux, improve at least when mother cut dairy out of her diet, at least for, for the time being, um, until baby was a little bit more, uh, baby's GI system was a little bit more developed. Um, but you know, if it's, if it's really um, hampering the baby's sleep, if the baby's crying a lot after feedings, then I would refer to the pediatrician. Thank you. And um, I guess one last question back on the visiting and then we're gonna have to wind this up and do another one. Um, people have so many questions. We, we have hardly even scratched the surface of everybody's questions, but back to the visitors, um, Dr. Natali, I know, you know, at Boober, we, we match people to postpartum doulas virtually right now. We're providing postpartum support and we're not 
matching to in-person because it just feels too risky um, on both on both sides, mm-hmm. you know, but some people do have the question, what if I have a baby nurse who, who quarantined or can I do that? Or what, what's your, just your general thought? Again, I think it's going to be the same, but um, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, I think um, at this time, if I had to make a recommendation, it would be not to, not to invite anyone into your home that could potentially put you or your family at risk. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that being a new, I mean, I have two kids as well. Um, I know that being a new parent is, is challenging, it's stressful, um, but there are a lot of things that, you know, a baby nurse is gonna help teach you, but you're gonna learn that anyway. You know, right. we've been having babies for thousands of years and we've managed, and if you, you know, between all of the availability with video chats and this and that, you're gonna, you're gonna learn this stuff um, if, you know, when you need to. You're not gonna do anything wrong. Um, and, I, and I think that it's really important to trust, you know, keep saying, you know, trust your instincts on that, um, but feel that, you know, feel that confidence that like you can handle it. Like you're gonna know, like maybe the first diaper is really loose or maybe, you know, you can't figure out how to button the onesie, you know. But, but, you know, people are smart and they figure it out and we're resourceful. And, and think of how resourceful we've been in the past two weeks where we're all stuck at home and we've managed to, to do so many things that, you know, we n- never thought we would be able to, to pull off. And so I think that that's really important. And I just think, I think it's really important to assume that anybody you're coming in contact with, if they are not symptomatic, is an asymptomatic carrier. And just assume that when you go to the grocery store and everybody looks healthy, keep your six feet away. You know, if you do that, uh, chances are you're going to be just fine. Um, so. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's something that we really want to stress to everybody out there. And I've always said this, even as a person who is a doula, who is a lactation counselor, who is a postpartum doula, um, you know, especially as I'm teaching classes right now, when we had the five-day ban on partners, I said, look, you're People have babies. You can do this. People can have babies. You don't have to even read a book, take a class. It, it's still going to happen. Um, so for the most part, you know, these things work and there are resources. We're all here on screens to help you if you need us. Um, many people, you will surprise yourself at, at the amazing things that you can do. I, I agree, Dr. Natale. And so I want you all to reach out to your local, you know, we're all doing these amazing Zoom postpartum support groups and um, there are lactation support groups and we are launching on Boober. We're working on kind of a, a call line so that you can you know, maybe be able to, to talk to somebody for a few moments um, and, and some shorter, quicker uh, virtual visits so that you can just get your questions answered. So and just know there's a lot of resources out there. We're all here for you. And um, thank you everybody for coming. And if you wanna say any last, last words, Julie, um, just to echo what you said, you know, you, you got this. I know it feels scary and it feels really surreal, um, especially bringing in a the new baby home and all of this, but you know, you've got this. Um, and we are here to help if, if you have any questions or just want a little extra support. Yes, so please reach out. Don't be a stranger, but also know that we, there's so many of us going through all of this together. You have so many people out there doing this with you. And um, we have lots of questions. I'm sorry, we couldn't get to everything. I hope we, I combined a lot of them and got as many in as I could. And we will, we will continue to do these webinars. So um, you can visit our, our resource page. We have a COVID-19 resource page at the Boober website um, where we'll update information and leave these webinars. So thank you everybody. Um, thank you, Dr. Natale and Julie, and we'll see you soon. And thank you so much to Park Slope Parents, um, also who is uh, sponsoring this event. They are a wonderful resource and you can visit the Park Slope Parents website right now, um, which has an amazing um, birthing kit resource that they have created. So we're really, really grateful to them as well.